Welcome to Arts in the City. I'm Magalie Laguerre Wilkinson at the Noguchi Museum in Long Island City, Queens. There's a lot going on here, including their newest exhibit, Museum of Stones. We'll give you a sample a little later in the show. But our first story takes us to a multi-site retrospective on the Young Lords. Tina Beth Pina reports. What was the Latin answer to the civil rights movement of the 1960s? It was the Young Lords, whose legacy for social change in predominantly Puerto Rican and underserved communities throughout New York City is still being felt today. It was one of the most active and successful organizations of the 1960s. The Young Lords considered themselves revolutionaries. They uh, believed in the independence of Puerto Rico, which they believed would only come about through revolution, but they also considered themselves socialists. And they fought racism and police violence and brutality in poor neighborhoods of East Harlem, the South Bronx, and the Lower East Side. The Young Lords were a group of first-generation Puerto Rican college students who took their cues from Marxism philosophy and the civil rights movement. They embraced other young minorities into their organization. They engaged in protests that were savvy, strategic, uh, that involved the community. They occupied Lincoln Hospital right here in the Bronx. They engaged in protests around issues of public health. Uh, they burned garbage in East Harlem to protest poor sanitation services there and they won tremendous reforms. All of this history has been dramatically documented in Presente, the Young Lords in New York exhibits at the Bronx Museum of Art, El Museo del Barrio, and the Loisaida Inc. Center. Each cultural site tells a story of the Young Lords in that part of the city with striking photos, video, art, and other archival materials. What the museum has done here is, is amazing. It's important that this be gathered, that this not be lost, that what we did was not in the vein. I mean, I know that we made an impact at that time, but very rarely are we credited for what we did. One of their biggest impacts was when they took over an East Harlem church, which wasn't providing any services to the community. The Young Lords renamed it the People's Church. For the 11 days that we had the church, we had a breakfast program. We had free medical clinic for the community. We had cultural events. It was the first place that Pedro Pedri read Puerto Rican obituary publicly. Um, so we kind of demonstrated what we could do with space and, and um, very little money, but resources from the community. The exhibition shows how the young lords organized as a paramilitary party and dressed the part, too. We were at war with the... U.S. government, and um, you brought it down, and we were, you know, at war with the city government. With all our bravado, being 18 and 22 years old, uh, we thought that um, we were going to change things overnight, and, um, and that was the way to do it. The Young Lords developed a 13-point platform to publicize what they stood for, and created a very popular newspaper called Palante, which promoted their agenda to the community and beyond. We didn't have the internet, we didn't have Twitter, we didn't have YouTube videos. Um, so how do you take the information you've got and how do you get it out to people in the community other than by word of mouth? You need a vehicle and that vehicle was a newspaper. Anybody that had a skill became part of the staff of Palante. A lot of the community wasn't necessarily totally literate. So we tried to use art to communicate the politics that we were, were working with in the community at the time. Denise was the highest ranking woman at the time, but like many women who were active in the Young Lords, she felt frustrated by the sexism within it. That machismo should be revolutionary and not oppressive. And uh, well, that's an oxymoron. There is no way that machismo can ever be revolutionary. It's like saying revolutionary racism or, you know, revolutionary xenophobia. The women made demands and they were met. They were elevated to leadership positions and the platform was revised. We want equality for women, down with machismo and male chauvinism. We wanted to deal with all the isms, the sexism, the racism that we grow up with in this society. Um, and, and that 
along with all the other ones, was not an easy one, you know, because where we come from and, you know, the, the patriarchal families that we all grow up in. The Young Lords also inspires um, a, a generation of artists who have been active uh, in the 60s, but all of a sudden, the fact that Puerto Ricans are being discussed in the mainstream media gives them confidence to form their organizations and their collectives. Increased Latino pride stimulated a renaissance in Latino music and art. Presente, the Young Lords in New York, shows the enormous amount which the Young Lords accomplished. But unfortunately, the party started to come apart, and by 1976, they were defunct, but not their impact on the city. I want to welcome each and every one of you today. For many of us, this is very surreal. We were not an after-school program. We were a paramilitary revolutionary organization. A wind in historical times, it was just a minute, less than two years. But it also shows what, again, like-minded, committed people that trust and love each other can do in a short period of time. That five people can get together in an apartment or on a campus and decide to start a movement that can change the world. And you don't have to be, you know, funded to do it. You don't have to go take a course on how to do it. You know, you just have to have the commitment and the desire for change, and it can happen. For Arts in the City, I'm Tina Beth Pina. The Young Lords exhibits at El Museo del Barrio and at the Loisida Inc. Center are still on exhibit until mid-December. And now, as promised, a look at Museum of Stones. It features sculptures by artists other than Noguchi, who, like him, were also inspired by the naturalistic beauty of rocks and stones. Entire rooms in the museum represent themes that demonstrate how stones have influenced civilization, from structures and weapons to science and anthropology. Some of Noguchi's stone sculptures are also scattered throughout the exhibition. wonder how makeup artists transform actors into terrifying monsters like the ones you see on The Walking Dead? Andrew Falzone asks himself that question all the time. Making stage and screen productions come to life takes many talented individuals. We had a chance to go behind the scenes and get a first-hand look at how makeup artists make the illusion of reality come to life. Jamie Ray has been working with makeup for nearly a decade. What started out as a focus on beauty makeup turned into an interest in special effects makeup. There are two completely different animals, but they stem from the same original concept. Both are based off of natural anatomy. It's just rather transferring it into another character completely or enhancing what's already there. Jamie is head of special effects makeup for BXC Studios, a multifaceted entertainment company specializing in film and commercial production. When their film cameras aren't rolling, BXC offers movie makeup classes for levels beginner up to advanced. I volunteered to be the class model for an advanced zombie class, and my transformation began with wardrobe. I took to the chair for what would become a nearly two-hour process, beginning with contacts to glaze out the color of my eyes. Next, Jamie applied a special prosthetic glue called Prosade for some of the additions she would be making to my face. And just as the Prosade begins to start drying, that's when you're going to get the most tackiness out of it, so you want to work pretty fast with it. After three latex prosthetics were in place, it was time to bring them to life by adding color. While Jamie had a number of tools at her disposal, most of the colors were made by mixing two or more together. Coloring in and around the mouth and scarring seemed to make the latex come alive. 
What I enjoy most about doing this kind of work is definitely creating characters and cr telling a story with my makeup. You know, I say a lot of the time that you could have a phenomenal actress or an actor, and if the makeup looks very false or fake, that will throw off the entire scene. Meanwhile, you could have a really bad actor, but you could have a really realistic looking makeup, and that will still allow the audience to stay with the story and feel like it's really happening. So your job holds a lot of weight on a production. For a hands-off approach, the Museum of the Moving Image in Astoria has a permanent exhibit that includes special effects makeup. Visitors can come face to face with a Chewbacca head and recreations of Jim Carrey as The Mask and Robin Williams as Mrs. Doubtfire. Even the mouth extruder worn by Marlon Brando in The Godfather is on display. However, hands-on movie makeup is becoming a lost art, according to curator of collections, Barbara Miller. More and more these days, those effects are being done digitally. The actors sort of are not carrying that material on them while they're performing. And I think that it's a mixed bag, the reality of that. I think that um, it's sort of too bad that this, this really, really special industry that's developed over the course of history of the moving image is really not as robust as it once was because there's simply not the kind of work that there used to be because so much is being done digitally. But BXC's classes are so popular that their most advanced students are offered a totally hands-on make-your-own zombie class. This year's event was held outdoors in Brooklyn's McLaughlin Park and the work on display was disgustingly realistic. Removing my movie makeup was also a bit of a process. Even professional makeup removers left adhesive residue that took the rest of the day to peel off. But before my transformation, I couldn't resist the opportunity to get into character. I'm Andrew Falzone for Arts in the City. I'm Pat Collins at DeWitt Clinton Park, where devoted dog owners let their pets run free. That unique bond between man and man's best friend is explored in the revival of the Broadway comedy, Sylvia, starring Tony Winters, Matthew Broderick, and Anna Lee Ashford. Now sit, Sylvia, sit. I'm not ready to sit. To play Sylvia, the frisky canine of the title, Annalie mastered a few smart pet tricks. The result, more than a few sore muscles. You know, I've been leaving rehearsal every day with my body aching. <laughs> so part of me is like, why does my body hurt so bad? And, and then I think about what I've been doing all day. I've been using everything that I've learned as a dancer in my life in this play. I'm trying to create a, a physical vocabulary that demonstrates to the audience that I'm a dog, but I, I'm still living in a human world. So it's a lot of up and down. I wear knee pads the entire play. My body is definitely feeling the strains of being a dog. <laughs> I just want you to be on your best behavior. Kate gets home any minute. Who's Kate? My wife, okay? When Greg, Matthew Broderick's character, returns to his West Side apartment with a stray canine he found in Central Park, domestic chaos ensues. After 22 years of marriage, there is another woman in his life, and she's a dog. Would you describe Sylvia as the third person in a very unusual love, love triangle? triangle. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I mean, in a definite way, it's like dating your yoga instructor, you know? <laughs> like an older guy falling in love with the simplicity of a real young woman, a real young girl. But in this case, it's a much, it's, it's a dog. When A.R. Gurney's comedy debuted 20 years ago, Matthew's real life wife, Sarah Jessica Parker, earned rave reviews playing Sylvia in the original production. Did you ask Sarah Jessica for any advice? Well, I asked, should I do it, you know? It was, it was a tough, tough one, but... Um, a tough but, decision? Well, yeah, and tough for her to, you know, she didn't want to tell me what to do, and um, this production will be different than her production, and none of us thought I would ever be playing uh, Greg, and because um, it came out of nowhere. This was all fully assembled, um, 
Except for Greg, I, I mean, guess. the cast. Yeah. yeah. The Sylvia cast member with the most costume changes juggles three roles. One is Tom, who's a gentleman that Matthew's character meets at the Central Park Dog Run. And he's one of those guys who can a little bit of a know-it-all, you know, telling you how you should do things and what to do. Mansplaining, they call it now, right? And the second is Phyllis, who is a former classmate at Vassar with Julie White's character. And she's sort of an Upper East Side socialite who's kind of taken over the whole world. And she's trying to make sure Matthew and Julie's character get properly introduced to society in New York. And the third is Leslie, who, without giving too much away about the plot, is a marriage counselor. And this couple needs a marriage counselor. I've resumed my career. He's working his career. We're paying for those kids to go to college. And are you fe feeling the empty nest syndrome? Yeah, but I think that my character is Kate. He's really happy to have that empty nest. Right at the same time that he's starting to think his work is meaningless and he wants to just, you know, w take long walks with that stinking dog. Nana, you sit, sit here, sit down. Sit over here, sit. Ouch! <laughs> After seeing Annalise Tony winning performance in You Can't Take It With You, Sylvia director Daniel Sullivan knew he had found his star. She, uh, she has a kind of extraordinary physical inventiveness, which is what you need for this. Uh, uh, when I saw her in You Can't Take It With You, um, the first thing I did when the show was over, I looked through the program to see who the choreographer was, because I thought the stuff was fantastic. And of course, there wasn't one. She did it herself. And that's what you need. You know, she has a kind of built in clown in herself that is very real, that is uh, constantly inventing. After the curtain comes down, Sylvia's cast and creators go home to, of course, their faithful pets. I have a dog that um, is six years old. Her name is Gracie, and she's a toy Australian Shepherd. She's uh, such a squirrel. She acts so silly. Dogs are wonderfully mysterious, or all animals are, really, in that way. But dogs particularly, because they seem to love us so much. Do you own a dog? I do own a dog. I own uh, a dog named Kissy, named by a two-year-old, and uh, a little uh, American rat terrier, it's called. You don't have to hit, you know. Well, it didn't hurt. It most certainly did. Sylvia is playing at the Court Theater, and you cat owners are invited, too. I'm Pat Collins for Arts in the City. Looking for something different to do during the week? There's always karaoke or watching a game at a sports bar. But our Barry Mitchell found a phenomenally successful new pastime that might cause some to say, that's entertainment. On the first Tuesday of every month here at Littlefield in Brooklyn, the pun is mightier than the sword. Yeah, boo yourself. My real name's Allie. Uh, I don't like when people imitate the way I walk when they choose to be alligators. <laughs> yes, it's Punderdome, the no-holds-barred competition for wordy nerds, and they've been packing them in. It's a mini-series, but it only has a pair of episodes. It's, it's called The Two Night Show. Um, I have won this about 15 times in the last three years, uh, so I'm very serious about it, which is very silly. Punderdome, created by Brooklyn-based comedian Joe Firestone and her motivational speaker dad, Fred Firestone. He flies in from St. Louis once a month to co-host. So I'll tell you, you know, I uh, Joe's mother, you know? Yeah. We, she likes to make love in the back seat of the car. I'm sorry. You know? She likes me to drive, I'll tell you what, you know. The first 18 people are individuals or duos that sign up at the door and get to compete. Joe gives them a topic. Uh, she creates, she's an amazing topic developer. It's just, I think she took a course in that in school. I don't think I did. Uh, anyway, it was, it, she, she does a great job. You don't know what the categories are going to be until you're actually up there. Right, we have about a minute and a half to prepare uh, with dry erase board in hand. The last time I competed, I was in a round for the digestive system. I had recently been out with a guy who had stumps for feet, um, but I didn't go on a second date because I'm lactose intolerant. Oh, lactose <laughs> intolerant. The energy never drops. There's always something happening on stage. We'll do uh, a sing-along. We uh, might even have somebody with an accordion singing a pun song. Can you imagine something like that happening? Once there was an octopus who said, I had a very bad meal now. 
I've got an awful hat to call the sturgeon, cause I feel eel now. I threw that in for the halibut. What kind of a crowd does Front Dome attract? I think it attracts a very smart audience. Because in order to appreciate what people do on stage, you have to have a good sense of humor, an appreciation of very convoluted thought processes. There are people from all ilk, people from the uh, business world, the tech world. There are comedians that do this. There are actors that do it. There are writers that do it. Always done with love. And even groans are a response that you want to get from this crowd. You are at a pun competition. What are you doing? You're a hipster. You're a hipster. How do we decide who wins? So we use a, a device called a human clapometer. They'll try to do their best to decipher who gets louder applause, and they'll give a number value to it. Puns must be integrated into a little narrative. It's about 70% delivery, you'll see, and yeah. about 30% quality of pun. The topic is TV show titles. I recently got an apartment with a lawn, said, but I had no idea what to do with it. I was like, um, you know, what do I plant in the front? Like, dan dandelion? I don't know. And then a neighbor came up and he helped me figure out my lawn order. <laughs> that was amazing. Great job. <laughs> How do we find out more? You can go to punderdome.com or go on Facebook or Twitter. We're also on there. And we have pun, pun, pun here at Punderdome. That's what we play. Barry Mitchell, Arts in the City. The Roaring Twenties are back in full force thanks to the Big Apple Circus. The tent is up, the seats are full, let the show begin. It's that time again in New York. As the seasons change, the Big Apple Circus changes too and brings to town a brand new show. The Big Top at Lincoln Center is alive and running for the 38th season of the Big Apple Circus. The Roaring Twenties form the cornerstone of this year's theme deemed the Grand Tour. Circus performers, many from family dynasties, hail from Africa, Asia, Europe, Australia, North and South America. They jump, dance, and dazzle audiences on this tour around the world. As the lights dimmed on the crowd, the lights were ablaze on the show before us. If you think your dog knows tricks, wait till you catch the doggy antics of third generation animal trainer Jenny Vidbell and her crew of crafty canines. Hula hoops take on a whole new spin when Chiara Anastasini gets a hold of them. This ninth generation performer seems to defy gravity as she turns herself into a human slinky toy. And what's a circus without clowns? The crowd loved their madcap mayhem and the way audience members are drawn into their world of circus slapstick. A new act seems to defy gravity itself. The Wheel of Wonder spins under the expert control of the Dominguez brothers from Colombia, South America. Like human hamsters, they walk their wheels with feather-like dexterity some 40 feet above the circus floor. This spinning act will leave your head spinning for sure. You have until January 10th to catch your breath and catch the Big Apple Circus. The FDNY is celebrating its sesquicentennial. That's its 150th anniversary. And in this month's edition of Hidden Gems of New York, we take you to a museum honoring New York's bravest. These faces chronicle the history of firefighters, the men and women who every day risk their lives to keep New Yorkers safe. Photographs line the walls of the New York City Fire Museum. It opened originally in 1934 in Long Island City as the Fire College Museum. 
and moved once more before settling here in Tribeca in 1987. The museum is separated into two floors. The top floor contains artifacts and models of firefighting equipment that were used prior to the FDNY's creation in 1865, when only volunteer firefighters existed and New York was a Dutch colony. The museum's bottom floor recounts the history of the FDNY with different fire trucks, helmets, and other items that the department has used since its inception. Also featured on the bottom floor is the museum's 9-11 memorial. This powerful exhibition contains a wall of photographs that serve as a timeline of the day's tragic events and a memorial to the firefighters who lost their lives. The New York City Fire Museum is open seven days a week from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. and is free for members of the FDNY, NYPD, and all U.S. military service members. That's our show for today. Thanks for watching. For information on any of our stories, visit the website at the link below. I'm Magali Laguerre-Wilkinson, and I'll see you next time on Arts in the City.